Hi, I'm Jill Maurer and welcome to my channel. On my channel we talk all about design, but generally we talk about human design. Today I'm talking about animal design. Number five is the polar bear. People have often wondered, how does a polar bear survive that much cold? Unbelievable amounts of cold. I, the coldest weather I have been in is 60 below, and I cannot imagine something surviving that without a lot of gear. So how does the polar bear do it? It turns out that polar bears are not white. We think of them as white because they appear white to us, but in reality, their fur is clear. But what's really interesting about their fur is that it is hollow. It is hollowed out so that their heat gets trapped in every piece of that fur and essentially they're insulated. They're almost a walking thermos. Number four is the dragonfly. What's fascinating about the dragonfly? Well, the dragonfly is incredibly, incredibly maneuverable. And for a long time, we thought that their four wings acted as pairs. In reality, the dragonfly's wings each operate completely independently. It's, it's fascinating to see them in slow motion. Number three is the crocodile. Most creatures, including us, have much better vision either at day, which would be us, or at night, say like an owl. An owl has excellent night vision, but doesn't see that well during the day. We have excellent day vision, but we don't see as well at night, which is why we require lighting. Crocodile can see both day and night. So what happens is, like a night vision creature, during the night, it, it, will, it will take light and reflect all that back to the eye. So it can see very, very clearly at night. What happens during the day, though? Because if during the day you've got all that light being reflected so concentrated into the eye, you would be blinded by light. What happens in the back of a crocodile's eyes is that these little membranes come out and they, um, they disperse the lights. So basically, crocodiles are designed to have built-in sunglasses and night vision goggles. Number two is the mimic octopus. Now this thing is really weird if you've never seen this. It, a lot of octopi, can, they can change color and they, they do some things to blend in their environment just like a chameleon might do but the mimic octopus takes this to a new level. The mimic octopus actually imitates other creatures. So it will imitate a lionfish by putting its legs out like this to look like a lionfish as it's swimming away. It will, it will get in a hole and retract uh, a lot of its legs and maybe just leave out two and imitate the patterns of a snake so it looks like just two snakes hanging out there. There's even video of this mimic octopus running on two legs carrying something across the sea floor. It looks very much like a chicken. I, what a headless chicken. Why or what it's doing and what it's imitating, I'm not clear, but that thing is pretty incredible. Okay, side note, it really brought finding Dory to light for me. I could not understand what Hank was doing. You know, how Hank suddenly became Randall from, from Monsters, Inc. Like he was, he was imitating things. I thought this is way beyond anything that an octopus can do. Oh, but not the mimic octopus. Old Hank was a mimic octopus. So who do I think is number one? The Japanese honeybee. The Japanese honeybee is a very interesting creature and it has created its own design. Honeybees are, are at risk of being attacked by hornets and these hornets come into the nest uh, and they, they kill the bees and, the, and most honeybees have no defense against it. About a hundred hornets can just annihilate a thousand bees but they have figured out the design of the hornets plan and they have created a counter plan. And this is how it works. The hornets don't come in all together. They send scouts and the scouts go to different honeybee nests and they, they leave their scent there and then move on. They go on about scouting so that the rest of the swarm can come in and just follow that scent and find it. Well, let me tell you what the honeybee has decided. What they have done is when a hornet comes near them, they actually want it to come in to their nest. And the hornet comes into their nest and starts leaving their scent. And the honeybees do this crazy thing where they'll, the ones near the hornet will start wagging. 
and they're communicating that, okay, we've got an intruder, so everybody get ready. The Japanese honeybee can survive to temperatures up to 118 degrees, while the hornet can survive up to temperatures of 115 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is what the Japanese honeybees actually do. They communicate with each other that they're about to do this, and then when they're all ready, they pounce at once, and they overwhelm this hornet. And they don't sting the hornet because that won't affect the hornet. What they do is they vibrate, and they vibrate in such a way that they create heat. How much heat? 117 degrees. That's enough to kill the hornet, but that the entire Japanese honeybee hive survives. I hope you've enjoyed this video about animals and their design. I upload videos every week always about design in some aspect of life and not even necessarily human life. I hope you'll join me next week. See you then.